So Tom, let me, let me ask you to put your consultant hat on because you, you consulted for many, many, many years. Okay. You're talking to a medium-sized business. They've got, I don't know, 25 locations and uh, you know, they got a bunch of switches out there and all that kind of stuff. Would you send them down the road of, we want you to go, I'll just, again, I'll use Cisco as the example, go all in on that and their tooling and their DevNet stuff and the various things they give you. Or would you say, we'll start today with Cisco because that's hardware you're familiar with and you have a good customer relationship, let's say with them. And then we're going to layer uh, glueware on top of that to do automation stuff. I've always been a proponent of, of doing a little bit more with things, but a lot of it's going to come down to the, the talent level that they have in the organization and the direction that they want to go in. Because if you talk to somebody who, you know, has like a basic networking level of knowledge and has no plans to do any kind of expansion on this, black box the whole way, because you're never going to know the difference. There's features in that switch that you'll never even turn on. But when you get a hold of those people who, who understand the value of automation, who understand the value of doing bigger and better things like, you know, building application acceleration or, you know, remote site failover or all that other stuff, that's an entirely different discussion that requires technical depth. And you can generally figure out pretty quickly when those people are capable of talking back to you. Because as a consultant, as a dirty, ugly, mean consultant, my biggest fear of selling that enhanced version is that I will never be able to leave this client because I will always be in here tweaking something that breaks and I'm not getting paid for that. So you're making a really important point here that which way you go is going to depend a lot on your ability to support that solution internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've seen this and, and I, I, will, I will caveat this. A lot of the work that I did was in school districts and the typing teacher is not the person to be working on your Novell server. So we did a lot of heavy touch <laughs> stuff, but there were a couple of places where the people who ran those organizations were all about, I'm going to automate the creation of user accounts across the network because I know how to get in here and fix this. So it was a bright spot in my life when I could just turn it over, you hear the keys, you fix it. And then when that person left, I was back in there constantly going, all right, he did something really weird here and I got to figure out how this works. <laughs> so the sword cuts both ways. And, and you have to understand that customer's level of technology expertise. And the clouds have actually done this really well because they have two options. You don't get to touch anything outside of this dashboard. And here's all the ugly APIs underneath that you can tweak to your heart's content, but don't call us when you break them. Hmm. So assuming some technical competency internally, then, would you say, you know, a third party tool, uh, you know, an Ansible, if you want to go open source or, uh, you know, a Glueware or an Abstra, if you had a specific need that Abstra could solve? Yeah, I would say that, that that's something you definitely want to look at. You want to give them the, the capability to have a place to tie everything back into. You don't necessarily want to hamstring them by saying, well, sorry, Cisco doesn't sell this, so you can't use it. Um, give hmm. them those options. But with the caveat, you're probably going to be spending a lot of time reading up on how to make this work. It's going to make you a better networking person. It's going to make you a better systems person. But if you're ready to put the wrench time and the book time in, you, the sky's the limit for what you want to do with it. And that's a so, lot more, that's a lot better as a career choice than spending time on Cisco's licensing strategy. I was going to say, not spending time on Cisco's licensing strategy is not just a good career choice. It's good for your blood pressure. It's good for your heart health. And it's good for not <laughs> going insane. Yeah, that's what I've, so many people have said that to me and uh, you know, I knew this was where it was going to go when Cisco got involved because they don't have the internal self-discipline to not do this. They don't have the, when it comes to money and profits, Cisco can't control itself from doing dumb things. And I would argue, and, I would argue and a people lot are of saying they're now like spending two days a week just working on licensing out of a, and not actually working on the product or get, extracting value from the product for their employers. And that seems to me to be a, a, a good career decision would be to just avoid like that. If that's something that you don't want to do, then you're going to have to find a way around that. And I think now we've just sort of come back to, here's a reason maybe why disaggregation would make sense. If your organization is moving toward the path of that SDN level, that Abstra, that Anuda, that, that glue where, where you're trying to put all the intelligence at a higher um, abstraction layer, that's where disaggregation and white box should be your thing. Why are you going to pay for Cisco and Abstra? It mm. goes back to Greg's point of the switch doesn't really matter if it right. does what you mm. need it to do. You know, now we've yeah. come, come away from, well, that, you know, this is actually a really interesting point because uh, uh, Tom, uh, you know, certainly uh, you and I beat our heads for many years against Cisco certifications, let's say, uh, Greg, you too. You know, part of that was, 
CLI commands, baby. How do we write this configuration <laughs> stanza to do the thing? We needed to do the thing. But if you've abstracted that and you've up moved it uh, you know, up the stack, so you're not down there in configuration stanzas, you're just using the SDN tool. What matters now from that perspective? Well, the SDN tool matters and your processes and your workflow matters uh, more than the intricacies of how to type a specific command. Cursed commands that <laughs> change from version to version. Or, none, you know, or even, less, even less salutary things like knowing when to reboot a switch because that's a, that's a known bug, yeah. right? Which is, and I think that's the thing about SDN is it moves the, the value proposition away. And this is where I start to get really torn between um, if I go and get Cisco's SD access or Cisco's ACI, then they are bound to the hardware chain. Now there's a feature, there's a, there's a positive there. That is um, the SDN controller to physical switch integration is owned by one company and it should work. Experience suggests that Cisco's getting it not particularly right, but it's, you know, in theory, customers are used to the way Cisco delivers products and then fixes them over time, right? Or gets them sorted out over time. But Juniper Contrail has an interesting model where it works really well with the Juniper stuff, but they'll bend over backwards to work with third party if you want to. They don't prevent you from having third party products, whereas Cisco definitely excludes you from having third party products um, in its, and not just in overt ways, but also in subtle ways. You know, like, oh, you want help with that third party product? Sorry, you're on your own there. There's the documentation. Have a nice day, right? Um, whereas you can go all the way out to the other ones where like Glueware and Appstra, which sort of embraces a pretty broad church of products, they've still got an approved list of products that they'll support, but you could go out there and get onto them. And you could even go all the way out to companies like Pika 8, who, um, who are building a campus uh, solution with hmm. an open source operating system you know, and so forth. So there's, it's, there's still plenty of choices out there. The landscape of enterprise networking per se. And then, you know, we're not even talking about SD-WAN here. We're I, only talking there's not about plenty of choices, not plenty of choices. If you're a, on the enterprise side of things, you brought a peak eight, which I'm glad you did. Cause mm. I, they somehow escaped my mind, but mm. uh, one of their founders wrote an excellent blog article on, you know, kind of the state of white box and aggregation or disaggregation of what that means for the enterprise a while back that I read, I, maybe July-ish timeframe, something like that. Um, and they're another player that's in that space that we haven't mentioned. So there is some choice. It's not just Sonic. You know, the poor PKA people are saying, going, You're in, <laughs> come on, we've been here a long time. And they have been here a very long time with a, with a robust product, as I understand it. So, And there's um, lots of I, other open, open network operating systems too. There's uh, IP Infusion, who sort of, seem to burn hot and cold. They haven't quite made up their mind whether they want to be selling to But I don't see most of these anyone's, or... you can list a bunch of them, right? Yeah, IP Infusion mm -hmm. and uh, Aknos, and I, I forget what all the, the, the long list is, but I think they're aimed more at the hyperscalers and so on, not enterprise. Yeah, they're all getting a bit lazy because they just want to sell to a few customers, a few big customers. They'd rather make a handful of big bets and sell to the bigger. But there's also a bunch of tier two and tier three clouds too, right? So there's so you know it's not just the top five clouds there's a whole there's 30 or 40 companies below you know the um that have clouds in europe or you know equinox has a big cloud infrastructure and uh you know so on and so forth and all those second tier people are all making buying decisions that are you know i think those companies are generally being lazy and cheap and saying we would rather spend hire 50 salespeople and try and target these 50 customers than to say we'll hire 500 salespeople and try and get to resellers and switch them out of Cisco. Because Cisco's hold on resellers remains, you know, the, the, the ability of your average reseller engineer to stop thinking about Cisco and try and sell something unique and mm. is, is pretty rare, you know, you know, 